Welcome back to The Heat. We're talking about the rise of the right in Europe. What is causing it and how much of a challenge does it pose to the European Union? We continue now with our panel and let's go back to Matthew in Berlin. And Matthew, we were talking a moment ago about one of the right-wing leaders uh, leading this change in Europe, and that was uh, Matteo Salvini. But let's look another, at another leader, one that you mentioned, and that is Viktor Orban. He's sometimes referred to as Europe's Trump. This week, he was rebuked by the European Parliament for his views. But how significant is uh, Viktor Orban in driving this nationalist, populist agenda in Europe? Well, I think he's one of many. I don't know how significant he is in terms of the wider movement, to be honest, because this has been happening in every individual country. There are forces in every country that have been driving this. If you look at neighboring Austria, for example, where Roland is now, this has been going on since the early 1990s, and the drivers have always been quite similar. They've been uh, migration. Uh, then it was the, the Balkan Wars that really drove this brand of, of far-right populism there. And in Hungary, it's, it's, it's something else. It's really more of a, a traditional political machine around Viktor Orban that, that has emerged, and he has made Europe much more the enemy, I believe, than in a number of the other countries that are seeing this. It, uh, Hungary hasn't really taken in very many refugees. They've used the threat of the refugees coming as a reason to kind of, you know, consolidate power in the country and take a hard line towards Europe. But what, what he has been attacked for by the EU now is not so much his views, but the, the steps that he's taken to undermine the freedom of the press, for example, to undermine the rights of NGOs in the country and this sort of thing. And uh, we'll see how it, it turns out. But a, a lot of critics look at Hungary today and his party in particular and say, well, this is no longer a democratic country under the sort of normal European standard. And the interesting thing about that is we, we refer to Orban today as a, as a populist, as part of, the, of this far-right movement, but he has traditionally been a member of the center-right bloc within the European Union, which is a party family that also includes Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats, for example. So it's these, these, these labelings are becoming more, more and more difficult, and you're seeing some parties like Orban's drift a little bit further to the, to the right. Roland, uh, Matthew was talking a moment ago about Austria. That's, uh, of course, where you are today. Uh, last year, the Freedom Party in Austria won 26% of the vote. They actually entered into the coalition government. What's changing in Austria? It is the absolutely the same numbers and the same figures as happened in Germany because both countries opened their borders. And I agree that Austria and Germany are far away from Peru and Lima. And so I would say to what was, uh, what was said just before, I don't know any country in the whole world with open borders except Germany and, uh, and, uh, and Austria. First, this is not the United States of America, it is not China, is it not Australia, is it nobody first. Then the uh, migration of, let's, as I said before, together with Austria, two and a half million people to integrate within two years, this is pure nonsense because those people don't speak the language, they are not skilled, 60% of them cannot read or write or count, and so their unemployment rate is 90% and the social security systems are running out of money. You shall accept that uh, Europe or Western Europe, Germany and uh, Austria cannot take more millions of people just for nothing and all the rest of the world uh, shrugs its shoulders and says, do it, just do it. So I would accept uh, if uh, uh, and so I cannot understand yeah. how anybody can say, excuse me please, such a pure nonsense. And the next thing is, um, quite different, Viktor Orban does not uh, play this card in the game. Uh, you should accept that the countries of Eastern Europe like Poland and Hungary fought their fought for their freedom, and they got it out of the hands of the Soviet unions. And they want to live their freedom and decide what they want to do. And this is a problem in right. Europe that Brussels is far away. Decision-making is intransparent, and many people do not accept yeah. this. And uh, this is about, but not that 
tremendous. It is the combination of Brussels and migration at least. Remy Pierre, let me get your response to that very quickly. That these recent, uh, well, the recent immigrants to Europe are actually posing a bigger burden to the countries that they're entering rather than making them any better. Well, what's interesting is to understand, you know, the, the role of Europe in, in, in different countries and how, you know, each national political system views its position of its own country inside the European system. Right here you have a vision from Orban, Salvini in Italy, different uh, populistic uh, leaders in, in Austria and, and Poland uh, looking at, you know, trying to define another version of, of the European Union, which would be an intergovernmental, not a federal model of the European Union. And they see the European Union as disrupting their old national domestic system. And you also have on the other side more, let's say, pro-European leader, uh, whether Macron, whether other, you know, social democrats, or central left, uh, center right movements in different countries, seeing the European Union as a, as a fortress that will provide a security for European values of secularism, democracy, and so on. And this opposition is, is key to understand, especially inside the, uh, the, the, the right wing party at the right. European Parliament, where both Orban and also some Christian Democrats are facing each other. And, and whether Orban, after the decision from the European Union to increase, include the, uh, the, cha the Chapter 7 decision against Hungary, yeah. will be stay, staying inside this, this uh, coalition against. Okay, Remy, let me ask you very quickly. Uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, not everybody is against immigration. We've got President Emmanuel Macron in Egypt, in, um, in, in France, rather. He managed to hold off Marine Le Pen and the National Front in French elections. Um, how successful has he been? Well, it's, it, in terms of, of the, the how effective he's been in terms of migration and integration, let's, let's be honest, France hasn't taken the same role and, and hasn't had to face the same amount of numbers of, of migrants inside France compared to Italy and compared to Germany. So Macron has, has an easy position of being able to try to say that, you know, the countries that have been, you know, welcoming more and more migrants should be more effective integrating positions where France didn't have to bear the bulk of the work. Uh, but actually, if you look at the, the, the integration inside uh, each one of those countries, you're seeing some key success stories of, of in, in, in different uh, sectors where you also have, for example, the, uh, uh, the cafes, restaurants, hotels, uh, sectors calling for more immigration because there's missing uh, you know, workforce in those sectors. There are some uh, you know, minority of sectors for the moment voicing their, their interest in having more migration, but there's possibilities inside the economy of fostering and building on additional migration. Whether you're looking at you know, trying to uh, downplay the voice of the National Front, I mean, right. Marine Le Pen is, is, is facing a strong uh, you know, limitation inside France, and, and it probably will not be able to be a serious threat to future re-elections in, uh, in, in France in the next four years, and we'll see additional you know, uh, political members from the right wing rise against Macron in the future. Matthew, one final question, and that is about the European elections, which will take place next year. Britain's Guardian newspaper described these elections in this way. The paper said, that's when the far right and populist parties will attempt to complete their power grab in the European Union. How much of a showdown will this be between the right and more liberal parties? in Europe? Well, it's going to be a huge uh, showdown and absolutely decisive for the future of the European Union because the way the polls look now suggests that the, the far right will make further gains and uh, they already have a, a, a pretty large share of the votes in the European Parliament. And I think the challenge for the mainstream parties is going to be again that this issue of migration is at the top of the agenda in so many countries. And there really isn't a sense in the countries that have been hit hardest by this wave of, of migration in terms of integrating people and so forth, that there's a real sharing of the burden. I mean, this is something that we haven't talked about. I mean, as, as was just said with, with Macron, you know, he is in theory in favor of migration, but France hasn't really taken in that many refugees here. And this was the, the main issue in Sweden, Germany and Austria over the past couple of years was that the rest of the EU did not step up and say, okay, we're going to help you shoulder this burden. And it doesn't look like that problem is going to be solved anytime soon because you still have countries, in particular in Eastern Europe, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, for example, uh, Hungary, obviously, and they're all saying, well, we're not going to take any refugees. And so as long as people keep coming, uh, this is going to be a very, very hot political issue and one that is, 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 is going to cause a lot of trouble for the future of the European Union. 
And that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for another edition of The Heat. I'm Arun Naidu. Thanks for joining us.